Yeah, we are live. <laughs> it is a little late. <laughs> just this ghost. That's okay. I stay late most of the, most nights, so starting a little late is not a big problem. Tonight we're talking about push rods, and I get questions all the time about push rods. And the most common thing, at least with the LS guys, now I know, and I put this photo up on purpose. The, the thumbnail photo that I use is of a big block board. Yes, I have run big block board stuff, not as much as I would like. Um, I did do. A, I have gone back and looked at a lot of big block forward stuff I did. And I have done a few, and I need to do more, though. I need to do more um, Junkyard uh, 460s, which I like. And also, uh, Mark's got it. Sanchez has got a 429 that I can run and do some stuff with. So either one of those, both of those are good. The thing that I like about the big block forward, in particular, one of the things that I really like about it is the fact that you can make it really big with a stock block. We've made 557s out of them. And that's something I can't do. Like if I go to the junkyard and I get a Gen 5 or Gen 6 or Mark IV, 454, the production block, I can't make a 550 motor out of it. In fact, normally what we do are 496s. I don't normally go bigger than that because I like the 4250 4 stroke on the big block Chevy. And that seems to work out very well. The big block Chevys, like most of these bigger motors, tend to have uh, windage problems. And so you can go to a 4250. 450, 4375 um, stroke crank that they, would, that they have. It's really common for big block Chevys, but I don't like to go that big on uh, unless you have a really, really good oiling system on them. And so normally the most common deal that people do on big block Chevys anyway is a 496. Uh, by contrast, a Ford going over 500 inches is not uncommon. In fact, it's more, much more common than not doing that. And like I said, I did a at 557 and all of the stuff from 500 to that 550 range are very common 510s 513s 520s all kinds of different combinations with different um overbore sizes and strokes that are available so it's pretty cool so i really like that about the ford now obviously i don't think that the ford has the same kind of aftermarket support i think that's been enjoyed by the big block chevy but it is um it does have enough and there's plenty of heads for them airflow research has trick flow edelbrock i think has some there there are lots of heads now for them it, much more now than when it was just <laughs> stock or ported stock you know you could run the stock heads or cobra jet heads or super cobra jet heads if you happen to be lucky enough to find those or ported versions of those and there are guys out there like the heads that i ran from the guys that um Cam Research or MPG, they um, they really know Ford's well. And like I talked about, their 600 horsepower package that they let me test made made right over 600, 610 or something like that. And so it, it obviously works very well. And they do ported versions of those heads and they respond fairly well. Now, aftermarket stuff, like I said, airflow research, trip flow, those kinds of things, that those are, you know, even, even another level above that. And obviously there are more race oriented heads um, for that stuff. Uh, Blue Thunder has, has been making stuff for that. Obviously, Ford Racing has had stuff for those. And the Triclo guys with their, I think they're called A460 heads. I ran a set of CNC ported heads on those and, and, and made well over 900 horsepower with that combination. So there's plenty of head flow available. If you want to make serious power, you can make those motors big. And that's for the Ford guys, that for the big black Ford guys, that's why I put that up there. But the question for tonight isn't specific specifically about big black horse stuff, although maybe we should do one later on. Before I get going, I'm going to put up my, um, so I promised a, uh, what was my, what was my, um, I had a good, uh, I even wrote it down. I had a good poll for tonight. And I wrote it down. So if, so if somebody was here last night and they were and they remember what I told them at the end of the I, I told them at the end of the stream last night, somebody remind me what my what my poll was gonna be. Um I, I can't remember. I wrote it down, but now I think I've taken that um uh, that binder and <laughs> I'm using it for something else downstairs. I just I didn't want to go get it. So somebody remind me what my uh poll was for early uh lives early for one school. And, and number two on the list, nice, Uncle Squirrels, obviously, number one. 
And don't forget to hit the like button. So tonight we're going to talk about when I when do I uh, upgrade push rods and or when do I change push rod length? And that's a fairly common question, as you might imagine. And part of it is because, like, if we look back at the LS crowd, um, they tend to change push rods with and, and often do with cam upgrades. So if you put a camshaft in, they're like, okay, well, now you got need to ch check the push rod length. Obviously, with a factory application, they're somewhere near 7.4 inches for the LS stuff, and that seems to work fairly well. And as I've talked about many times on the LS stuff, I have a video up on uh, measuring push rod like making sure that it's right. Now, on an LS, it's different than like on the photo that I have for the big block because the big block Ford has an adjustable valve train. Some of the stuff, some of the big blocks, like the big block Chevy, they don't have adjustable valve train. They have a bolt down rocker like the LS does. And so what happens is when you check your put, when you decide on your push rod length or choose your push rod length, what you're doing is choosing the amount of um, compression, basically, that you're putting on the piston. You're putting, you're choosing the preload or plunger movement on the on the piston on the um, lifter. And the, and the reason for that is that that's what's happening. When you tighten the rocker down, what you're doing is the spring is going to be stronger than the, than the push rod is until the push rod has uh, oil pressure in it. Um, you're depressing the lifter. On, a, on an adjustable valve train, um, when you're adjusting that, you, there's a little bit more leeway there. And on the forward one that I showed, when I choose, uh, when I choose push rod leg, we go through a fairly easy procedure and it's basically just getting the camshaft on the heel of the cam. So it's on the base circle of the cam. And then what we normally do is we'll use an adjustable push rod and something that starts out close and has the range that we can do. And what I do is I just do the uh, wiggle pattern test. That's, that's what I call it. Real sophisticated. Th this gets me in the ballpark because ideally what you want is, if you were to take a Sharpie or some other kind of marker and mark the tip of the valve and with the spring and, and, a, and not a checker push rod, <laughs> a real push rod in there, and you were to uh, tighten the rocker down, take all the lash out of the, whether it's a hydraulic roll or solid, whatever it is, and then, you, and then you rotate the motor around, what you want is the rocker, on this case it's a roller, could also be a slider, what you want is the pattern to be even and in the center of the, um, of the tip of the valve. So you want it centered. You don't want it off to the, the far side tip or the near side tip. You want it kind of centered. People would argue with, the, oh, I like it more to the inside or I like it more to the outside, whatever. But I like it in the center. And the way that I find out whether or not that's going to be close with just a checker push rod, because we don't want to put, especially if you have lots of spring pressure, if you're running a solid roller cam and it has two or 300 pounds of seat pressure, you, you, can, you can break the checker push rod. So, because it's just a threaded deal. So what I do is what I, I, I put the camshaft on the heel of the cam, which means it's not on the lobe anywhere. It's just somewhere like we showed here on this particular camshaft. So you can see, you can see this dark part. So that's, that's basically about the start of the heel of the cam and the heel of the cam goes all the way around. So anywhere in there where we're not on the lobe part where it's actually lifting the valve, anywhere, anytime we're there, we can check this. So what I do is we put it there so that the basically the lifter isn't moving anymore. You can visually see that. We normally do this with the intake off, um, or you could do it with a push rod uh, down in the hole on the lifter and see when the push rod stops moving, basically. Then you can check it. So what I do is I put our adjustable rocker on there. We I set it on there with the cam in that position and the push rod, our checker push rod, uh, touching the rocker. And then what I'll do is I just adjust the push rod until what I do is with the, the rocker in contact with the push rod and the valve, I just like wiggle the rocker back and forth. And then when you do that, the roller tip or the slider part of it will make an impression on the valve tip. Because remember, you put Sharpie or some other kind of blue dicom or whatever you want to put in there, and it will make a mark. What I'm looking for is, again, I just want that mark to be centered. It's not going to be it's not going to be wide like it is when it's running because the roller is not moving back and forth across the the um, the valve tip. It's just going to make a mark. And what I'm looking for is that thing to be relatively centered. Now that's not that might not be ideal. That might not be the ideal length. It might not give you the right pattern after you do that. 
99 times out of 100, it's going to, <laughs> which is why I use this shortcut. So I just move the rocker back and forth, look for the pattern. If the pattern is in the middle, that's where I would start for push rod length. Then I take our checker push rod out. I measure that and go, oh, that's like 8.1 inches or whatever, or something close to that. It might be 8.125. I go with an 8100 or an 8150 because normally, unless you get custom push rods, which I hardly ever do, I'll take a shelf thing. If, if it's plus or minus 50, I'm usually fine, especially on an adjustable valve train. I'm not worried about that. And then I'll put the push rod in and we'll get the right push rod length. We'll put everything together. We'll lash the valves. We'll do all that stuff. And then we'll spin the motor over by hand, you know, just with, the, we, you can spin it over on a dyno. I don't normally do it. This is normally all done before the motor even goes up on the dyno if I'm building one. So I'm building one. Then I'll, I'll then rotate the motor around a couple of times. And then that rocker will leave. And this is really easy with a, um, with a uh, solid, either flat tap it or solid roller camshaft because there's no movement in the lifter. Normally what I'll do on hydraulic stuff is especially big blocks or small blocks or forwards where we, where we can just prime the oiling system and I can pump the lifter up and then we can rotate it around with the, with pressure in the lifter. We rotate it around and I get my pattern. And then when I get the pattern, I go, Oh, well, that's a little bit too long or that's a little bit too short. I adjust accordingly. And then I have my push rod mic correct. And on a, you, you can't really do this. So on an LS, because it's a bolt down push rod. I mean, it's a bolt down uh, rocker assembly. So what you do on a bolt down rocker assembly, whether it's an LS or a big block or whatever it is, on a bolt down rocker assembly, basically like with the LS, you're, I look at the how much preload you're putting into the lifter. Some guys like to tell you that that's in 10 thousands or 15 thousands or 20 or 50 thousands or whatever their number is. I don't do it by that. I, I do it by, that way I don't have to measure anything. I do it by the number of turns. So once I get to zero lash, once the rocker is touching both the push rod in the cup and the valve, once there's no slack there, basically, and you can just kind of finger tight the bolt, what happens is now the rocker will be up from the curved section of the rocker cup. And what you're trying to do is get the rocker down solid on that rocker stand. So that distance that you have between the rocker and the stand is basically going to be the preload in the lifter. So what I like to do is go between, you know, a half a turn. If you get down on a half a turn, that'll still run. If you get down, it takes a full turn, that'll still work. Turn and a half, that'll still work. I don't normally go any more than that. So uh, if you go a half a turn, that's going to be really, really close to the right push rod length. If you go to one and a half turns, that's getting to the point where the push rod is actually maybe getting on the long side. And what happens is, is if the, if the push rod is too long, especially on an LS application, but on others also, if the push rod is too long, what happens is the lifter pumps up and it'll hold the valve open. We've had them <laughs> early on when I was putting LS stuff together, we've had them be long enough that they just don't make any compression when you're rotating them. Um, because we, we tried starting it after just, you know, we just tightened everything down. We're like, oh, okay, that's good. Oh, that seemed like a lot, but we just tightened it down. It seems to be fine. And then we try to start it in one bank on uh, this case, because one side was seemed like it was okay. And the other side was not. And so then you've got to go back and remeasure everything. But one side was making no compression. We're like, sounds like it's only running on four cylinders, which is exactly what it was doing. It was only running on one, one bank. But if you, if you compress them too much, if the push rod's too long, like on an LS or other uh, non-adjustable valve train stuff, and the push rod is too long, it will hold, it can hold the valve open. And then it, you won't get any compression. And, and so that's bad. You can also have it be where it's <laughs> sometimes not and sometimes is. And, and, and it could be intermittent. Um, you know, that's why I say in that range to a half a turn, and we need to run about a quarter of a turn. It's just at a quarter of a turn, it's hard to tell whether that's just the slop in the assembly or if that's actually, if you're actually compressing the lifter. Um, and then after you do it once, unless you can pump that lifter back up, there might now be a quarter of a turn of slop in that because you've already compressed the lifter a little bit. So until that lifter gets pumped back up, it might have that much play. And now it might not feel like there's anything. So, and it's hard on an LS because we can't pump that up unless we crank the motor over like on the dyno and because it's a gyrator pump. Um, I've seen people hook pressurized systems up to that, like when they do pre-oiling on them. We don't normally do it like that. We do we do it by filling the crankcase. 
with pressurized air when we first, before we first start them, we seal everything off, put pressurized air into the crankcase, one or two pounds, that pushes the oil up into the pump and then we hit the starter, no plugs in it, the thing spins over fairly fast, the pump grabs it right away and then we see, because we have a hard line going to a mechanical gauge on the dyno, it also goes to an electronic one that we see on the readout too, but it goes to a mechanical gauge, the line goes right out of the back on the LS and it goes right to the gauge and then we spin this thing over and and normally what happens when we do it, when we do that method, we see oil pressure almost immediately. I mean, it's a it's a few cranks and, and, and it starts to grab the oil and, and start pushing it up. And so we spin it there on the starter for, you know, until we have 40 PSI or so uh, cranking oil pressure. Then we know, okay, it's it's happy enough and we can start it. Everything's got oil and stuff. Um, and, that, and that works out fairly well, but it's difficult to do that when you're doing all the adjusting on, on the LSF. It's not nearly as much of a problem on something that's already been run. Like if you ran a motor and then you change the cam, like we ran on the dyno, you run the motor, you change the cam, and then you go to put another cam in, then you have to figure out whether or not, and we're going to talk about that right now, what things change whether or not you need to change your push rod length. What, what, what things could have happened that would ne necessitate a push rod change? One, we already talked about, well, was the push rod length right to begin with? So did you are were you already in a position where you were dangerously close to hanging the valve open? Was the push rod maybe already too long? Um, so then you need to shorten it a little bit. But like when we go to, if we put a camshaft in, one of the things that can change whether or not you need a different push rod is the base circle of the cam. If the, essentially that part that I was telling you about, so if this part here, <laughs> essentially if this part here is closer to this, um, then you've reduced that and that's going to require a longer push rod. All cams, all aftermarket cams are not, and some factory cams are even different from other factory cams. They're not all ground on the same base circle. So if you have a change in the base circle of the camshaft, if it's smaller, you're going to need a longer push rod. If it's somehow bigger, then, which would be uh, much less common, I think, then you're going to have to go with a shorter push rod. So unless they tell you exactly what, and, and the, the good cam guys will know what their base circle is. They, they'll, they'll be able to tell you, they're like, okay, you have an LM7 on there. It's this base circle. And the cam that we gave you is ground on this base circle. That's a difference of five thousandths or something. That's not anything to worry about. If it's 50 or 100, <laughs> then you have something to worry about. If it's going to change the, if it's going to necessitate a change in push rod, like I should say, of 50 or 100 thousands, you're going to have to adjust for that. Again, maybe and maybe not, like on the LS stuff, if your current push rod is a 7.4 and you have a, a turn and a half and you go down in the base circle of the cam, and now you might think that for the same number of turns, you'd need a 7.35 push rod. Just put the 7.35 push rod in there. That means you just have a turn of of uh, of uh, a lifter preload, and it will be fine. So, like I said, you have a range in there, and, and it all works. And and even though I've done videos on the effect of different length uh, push rods and what effect that has, it kind of has the effect of making the lifter into a short travel lifter, which can be beneficial for. 95% of us, I just wouldn't even worry about it. Just figure that that's the safe range. You'll be in there. You don't need one or two more horsepower at the top end and sacrificing power at the bottom end by putting a longer push right in there and getting rid of that. And if you're revving the motor and you want to put uh, short travel lifters in there, all of that's good. But again, that goes to the range of less and less people do that than just do the normal kind of thing. So the other thing can, that can affect whether uh, the length of the push rod that you need, obviously, is milling the head. So the push rod sticks up through the head. So if you bring the head down closer, you're going to need to change the length of the push rod. If you, or you can, if you mill, a lot of times guys don't mill a ton off the head. I mean, 30 thousandths is a, is a pretty good cut on a cylinder head for most applications. Some guys might go more than that. Or you can also mill the block. So milling the head or the block is going to obviously push them closer together. Effectively, it's going to make the push rod stick farther out the head. So you might need to shorten the push rod if you mill the head and or the block. And milling the block is not that uncommon. Um, most times what guys do is just do a surface cut. All they're looking for is making sure 
that the gasket mating surface is smooth and obviously on MLS also has the right finish. But a lot of times, and especially on older factory applications, Dodge is a perfect example of this, where the piston might be 50 or 100 or 200 down in the hole. Um, milling the block will bring the compression up and that's beneficial. You have to you have to be concerned about doing too much. You're like, oh, I take 200 off and let's get it at zero deck. That's all great. Then you put your heads on, then no intake manifold fits because, you know, basically you've changed that dimension and now the intake manifold won't line up. That's a, that's a consideration also in milling the heads. If you mill too much off the heads and you go to put the intake manifold on, now the bolt holes don't want to line up. So you have to take that into account when you're doing that. Um, and then also like on these, not on an LS so much, but on a small block Chevy and a big block Chevy, when you go to put those on and you mill the head, the you you may also have to mill the intake manifold to make it fit so we have uh the cam base circle obviously will change whether or not you might need a push rod uh, milling the head milling the block um also different cylinder heads so if you take a stock head of, of any kind of variety on, on any kind of motor really and then put an aftermarket head in the odds are very <laughs> it's very the odds are very strong the odds are very tall Odds are very good. That's what I'm looking for. The odds are very good that you might have to change the push rod because all of the things on the head now might be in a different position relative to the stock head. So the 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 boss where the the rockers bolt to, if you have guide plates, the the valve length, uh, lots of those things can be changed. And so now you have to adjust the push rod. You know, the angle and all that stuff is, is normally going to be the same, although sometimes you change the valve angle too. a twisted wedge uh, trick flow head is a good example on a five liter Ford. But um, but if you change where all of that is, the length of the, the, the valves and then the position of the rocker and all that stuff, then you might have to change the push rod to adjust for that. The, a lot of aftermarket heads are like that aftermarket um the mast ls heads i think are like that if i remember right some of the trick flow stuff was like that you know after that's not unusual for an aftermarket head to require you to put a longer and or shorter normally it's longer but but a longer or shorter a different length and stock push rod to have it work properly to put the rocker in the right geometry normally what they do is tell you that because if somebody <laughs> some aftermarket company we we hope but this is normally the case if they went to the trouble of, you know, casting and machining heads and offering them for sale, more than likely they put it on a car or put it on a motor and run it, at least on the dyno, and said, oh, when we put this on and we took our stock 882 iron small block Chevy head off and put this Edelbrock Performer RPM small block Chevy head on, we had to change the push rod. Let's make a note of that so that in the installation instructions it says, hey, you're probably going to have to go up hundred thousandths and push rod length and, and even if they don't give it to you exactly that's something you should check but if they tell you these normally require a hundred thousandths longer push rod that's really a good place to start um, even then i don't normally if i'm building a motor don't look at that as an absolute number i look at that as oh that's a good starting point um, and a lot of times again we'll just go back to the method using an adjustable push rod length and uh, an adjustable push rod checker and then we'll check it and see it would go oh yeah look it worked out it's actually 100 and and then we'll get that right push right it's um it's good uh and that that works out so um let's see what else what else could change that um the block the head the different kind of head the the different lifters can also change that too so and 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 whether like if you're going from a flat tappet to a roller either a solid roller or a hydraulic roller the hydraulic roller, the lifter is going to be longer, basically. And so the push rod, the push rod that you use with that normally is going to be shorter than, than a flat tappet. Going from a solid to a hydraulic flat tappet might necessitate, they might be the same, but it also, it's definitely worth checking, but they also might be different because where the cup is relative to the face that rides on the camshaft, that distance might be different. Um, hydraulic and solid roller, a lot of times are different, different hydraulic rollers or flat tappets from different manufacturers also can be different. Um, so there are a lot of things. Normally, these things necessitate you checking just to make sure. And the thing is, we've run stuff on the dyno that's 50 or sometimes 100 off. 
because it's what we had and we had to make the run for what we were doing it's probably okay um but and, and like i said i did the video on the ls swinging the push rod length i think i varied it by 150 thousandths because i think we went from a 7.3 to a 7.450 or something something in that range i remember that uh a lot of times with, and this is more often with adjustable valve train stuff, that we go, okay, look, that that uh, contact patch on there, eh, not ideal, but you know what? <laughs> and this is what Brulé always says, you know what? For who it's for, meaning me, I'll be fine. <laughs> so, so I get that a lot. Uh, but it, but again, for the running it on the dyno, it's not it's not going to be a big deal. Before I, if I were to put it in a car, I would I would want to make sure that it's closer to being, you know, what I would call optimum, with it centered in the valve. And and somebody I think I was asking whether it's um, uh, the valve open or the valve closed. It's always with the valve closed. And that's why I start with that simple measurement, and then we do a dynamic one where we rotate the motor and get a contact patch. And then then it is opening the valve. And when it's opening the valve, opening and closing the valve, that's when the tip is you know moving moving across the valve tip and creating some sort of wider contact patch. When I do the just wiggle test, basically, it's just it's just kind of a fine line because the contact point. And normally this is with a roller rocker. The contact point between the roller rock and the valve tip is very, very small. Um, but what it does is when it's rolling, when it's dynamic, it actually sweeps back and forth across that a little bit. You know, you don't want it to go all the way across from one end of the valve to the other end. Um, normally it's centered and normally, you know, it's a, it's, it, it's a center stripe in the cent in the middle of the valve. So all that works out good. So that is my spiel on, on, when you might need a, or a different push rod length and when you need to adjust it, it's a good thing to check. Um, you know, especially like I said, when you're putting a camshaft in or if you're before you're putting it in, when you buy the camshaft, that's a good question to ask people. Well, is, the, is this the same base circle as the cam that I'm taking out? On the LS stuff, they should know that, that the, all of the LS manufacturers, um, Steve over at Cam Ocean or Brian, Brian Tooley, the guys at Comp Cams, all of those guys I'm sure know uh, the guys at Texas Speed, I'm sure all those guys know what their base circle is and whether or not it changes it. And if it is, it, and if it is changed, how much has changed to give you an idea on what direction you really you need to go to. On the big block Chevy stuff, uh, or on the big block Ford stuff, you know, we, I, I, like I said, I normally just we we check it and make sure that it's accurate, make sure that's right. <laughs> Depends on if you're running a steel rod or an aluminum rod. I'm sure we're getting into measurements here. Um, so let's see what you guys got going on. Yeah, foreign automobiles, Mopar's like at 200, a quench of 230 thousands. So some of those things are way down. I think that the I think that the slant six is pretty far down in the hole. I can't remember now where the I don't think the Magnum is nearly as bad as that. Some of the early LA stuff was like that. I have no issue with 35,000 piston head clearance. No, that's that's a good amount. PWs are 40 thousandths down the hole because the chamber is flush with the deck height. Just trying to look back and see if anybody had any questions. Is there a trick to measure for a new push rod without the special tool? You can also do it by putting the push rod just without a without an adjustable push rod. You just do it by putting the push rod in there and seeing where you are with the push rod that you have. If you put a push rod in there and the rocker is like angled like this, with this being the push rod, <laughs> it's angled like this, then the push rod's too short. If it's angled like this, then the push rod's too long. It can get it, give you an idea of what's going on. Engines always run best when the piston hits the head a little. <laughs> Richard, how far can you bore a stock LS2 block? We never go more than like five thousandths or something on an LS2. Oh, 
Okay, people talking about Trunnion upgrades. I took apart a 318 out of a 78 D250 truck, all factory parts, pissing down 200,000. Yeah, the, some of the Dodge stuff is like that. Um, some of the big block stuff, I think, I remember Dulcich telling me about it, that um, because I've only ever looked at that 1440, and um, I don't remember measuring how far the pistons were down. But on the on the small one, though, it was definitely down. Aluminum rod stretch more, yeah. Well, that's another good point. Uh, I always check push rod length after head block resurfacing or head gasket thickness. That can change it also, uh, although we don't normally see a big change in head gasket thickness. I mean, the common head gasket sizes for like an LS would be 41 and 53, somewhere in that range. Um, I've seen guys put really thick ones in there. I've seen them do, I mean, I think, I think um, Kazi did a 300,000 <laughs> thick head gasket because he was, you know, changing the deck height basically um, for, for engine masters. But um, normally it's not, it's not a big amount though. Unrelated, thanks for posting the cam swap video. I swapped my LS2 cam with a BTR Stage 2 NA cam, and your video helped. Put a fast 102 on there, so that should be a good one. E85 in that car. Yeah, the Calif gas in California is expensive. Richard, 89 5 liter small block Ford stock, lower end upgrades to maybe 360 horsepower. We'll be running in a marine endurance race for three and a half hours. <laughs> It's a good max RPM for engine life. The the parts will actually withstand quite a bit. The thing you run into with endurance racing is heat management, both water, which not usually as big of a problem with boats since you usually have an unrestricted supply of cold water. Not a lot of guys running. I don't know if you're running that in the ocean. Not a lot of guys running salt water through them. Some, some do, but even if you're not running that and you have a sealed system, you have a lot of water that could be used for cooling, especially like for oil coolers and stuff, but keeping the oil, you know, at a reasonable temperature, keeping the motor at a reasonable temperature, making sure the tune is right. Um, I've never run one for three hours uh, at wide open throttle. <laughs> out at the silver state, we did it for like 30 or 40 minutes. That's not nearly the same. Although we have run, uh, I don't know if they're wide open throttle for that long. But we have run lots of endurance racing with the Mustangs. Richard, I have a shaft rocker on a traditional small box Chevy. Do I adjust the rocker like an LS? The shaft rocker, is it is is the are the rockers themselves don't don't do they not have adjusters on them on the small box Chevy? Normally they have normally even though you have a shaft rocker set up, the rockers have adjusters on them. Your favorite part of the evening, mine too. <laughs> yeah, cause he does magic. I know, and he picks weird stuff and still makes a million horsepower. I changed my push rod length when I installed titanium valves with longer stems. Yeah, the the longer valve will definitely necessitate a, a longer push rod. And then if you put lash caps on them, that can do it also. Lucas mentioned how much 450 wheel horsepower for what combination was that? Unrelated, thanks for posting the camp. So, oh, okay. 450 wheel horsepower LS2 for a cammed LS2 with a fast on it. That's good. Let's see, Richard, I'm doing a 5.3 swap on my truck and putting a truck Norris cam in. What's the recommended springs and push rods? I, I don't know about the push rods. That's something you're gonna have to measure. But the springs, they should have a spring package available for that. The Brian now has, they, they just introduced their own beehive springs, but they also have dual springs for that.
Do you run Junkyard push rods in your Junkyard LS builds? I have a lot. Yeah, the the uh, L33 that I run, the blower on, and the turbos on, and all that stuff. That still has the factory push rods in it. Where is the break point? I don't. I don't know. There's no. There's no. I can't tell you that. Oh, it. 601 horsepower the push rod breaks it's more a function of the spring and the rpm uh bws 909 good evening richard i literally received my new push rod length checker today and some new rocker studs to determine my new push rod length for the <laughs> the older 270 hr cam install in in your five liter i would imagine Richard, what's your opinion on having a small amount of lifter preload versus a large amount of lifter preload? Take a look at the video. I did a video on that where we adjusted the push rod length, and that's exactly what it did. Normally, what guys do if they're racing and running RPM is they have very little lifter preload, and they don't normally do that with a longer push rod. Um, they do it with a, a uh, short travel push rod. It's, it effectively does the same thing. What you're trying to do is get rid of what is essentially aerated oil because if you've ever seen what's going on in an oiling system um, it's not pretty and so you're getting rid of, rid of aerated oil and the more that you get rid of um, I think that the less squishy it, it becomes at what point do bar lifters become necessary lifter rpm or both I, I don't think that there's an absolute number there given that guys have run like with the LS stuff, they've run past 8,000 RPM with the stock lifter trays and and, and hydraulic roller lifters that uh, I don't know where the link bar becomes necessary. A lot of times for us, the link bar stuff is is a, is not a necessity. It's only the fact that, that for some applications, that's all that they have. Uh, A buddy of mine built a 455 Pontiac and used a set of rebuilt rods when he put it all together. One piston <laughs> poked out of the bore a quarter. One of the rods was for 421. I actually had that happen to me. Um, somebody used a, what is a 5155? I think that's a 289 rod. So one of the, <laughs> one of the rods in the build set uh, was a, was a, um, the, all of the rest of them were 509s, I think, or what? What is it? What's the? What the? Yeah, yeah. That's that's a small block or small block Ford uh, rod length, and then the one that he had. One of them was a 5155, if I remember it. Uh, there's a formula on out there where it uses rocker ratio, rocker bolt thread pitch, and push rod length to determine how deep you push the, the plunger. Why would rocker ratio affect that? Can you increase the rocker ratio on a rocker, single over a cam rocker arm valve train like a 4.6 or 6.2 Ford? Um, you'd have to have rockers made to do that. And I, and I don't think I've ever seen any um, higher ratio rockers for those, like for the modular Fords. Trying to build an NA62 and there's <laughs> no aftermarket yet. Sometimes it's hard when there's nothing out there. I, I don't know what the break point is. I, I, I can't answer that. I, I know you're looking for something specific in the same way that people are looking for how much boost can I get away with on stock uh, ring gaps and stuff like and questions like that. I, I don't know what that is. Uh, 4.8 liter BTR truck Norris cam. I know BTR recommends 560 valve springs. I was looking at PSI springs and they don't have 560. Should they go? You, you need to go up in spring. You don't want to go down. Because what's the what's the lift on the BTR cam? Is it is it 550 or something? 
and I know he's tested the, and I, we've talked about doing a story on the um, no springs required version of that truck Norris cam, which is interesting because then you can run LS three springs with it. Oh, David, so you're going to be running your river water, nice 160 degree thermostat. It's not quite wide open. And that'll, that'll be good. Shaft rocker system versus upgrade studs and girdles. Huge difference trying to decide if it changes worth it. I don't know what what motor that's on. Is that on? Are you talking about on an LS? The BTR Truck Norris Cam, they have a version that says no springs required. You cannot put a Truck Norris Cam, a standard high lift Truck Norris Cam, the 553 lift or whatever it is, with a with a five with a 706 spring on it. It, it won't work. The 706 or the springs that are on a 706 head or an 862 head, um, or some of the 317 heads also have very low lift springs on them. They're they're less than 500 lift. Uh, grooves and lands. I, I already um, told you how I test it. I, I don't use that method. It doesn't mean that it doesn't work. It just means that this is the way that I do it and it's worked for me and it continues to work. So I don't see a need to change it. I fully tend to check once I get the new push rod length for the sake of experience. Have you really ever encountered and valve clearance with any heads using a 274 cam. Yeah, I think you can. I think with a big valve head, I think you can run into piston and valve clearance. And again, it, it depends on what you're talking about. There's no standard, um, as, far, as far as I know, uh, there may be differences in pistons. There may be differences in how far down in the hole or out of the hole they are. There's differences in how much that the, the, um, the, deck height is how where the valve drop is on the head set of heads that you have um you know there's a lot of things that can affect it that's why the best thing as you get closer you know there are lots of cams that will fit in there and never hit a stock cam is a good example you just put it in anything and it will work but as you get closer and closer to the point where we know it's going to hit anything to the high side of that which that 274 cam definitely is uh, on small block forward stuff anytime you start getting close to that I just check it. The did somebody must ask a question about a plus one on a camshaft, right? Plus one means a one degree advanced ground into the camshaft. Uh, I think it'll be good because liver noise makes ported heads and cams for a 62, which flow 338 at 650 lift. Yeah, that's a, that, you can do a lot with that. Yeah, one, uh, Corey, 111 is the LSA. That's not the same thing. Yeah, the push rod doesn't affect the valve lift. Nathan, question with increased boost, increased power, you increase coolant temperature. Yeah, it has to process more, more BTUs. Richard, on traditional small block Chevy, just asking if you see stability difference with a shaft system versus studs and girdles. Um, I don't run motors normally with either one of those, so I, I'm not the right guy to answer. I don't usually build motors that require um, shaft rockers on them. Um, girdles we've run on a lot of stuff. I don't remember doing one on a small block. I've run them a lot on big blocks, um, and usually that's an RPM thing.
Jay, were, was, did, did anybody remember what the poll was supposed to be tonight? Because I don't. I don't remember. I'm going to have to do another one. I, just, I didn't bring my page up. I'm, I feel ill-prepared. <laughs> Why would my G8 be overheating everything been done except temp sensor? Could that be it? It could have a faulty sensor. You should take a, um, those heat guns, especially the, like I got one from Harbor Freight. They're pretty inexpensive, and you can actually find out what the temperature is. Any, any tips on keeping coolant temp down when leaning on the motor for more than 10 seconds? Y your cooling system should be able to do that. You should be able to run... Uh, like for instance, in the Mustang, on my stock Mustang, <laughs> we ran the Silver State with the stock cooling system, uh, and we found out that running it at lots of RPM, it didn't like that. But it liked running it like between 4,000 and 4,500 RPM in fifth gear. At in this case, when it was stock, it was like 147 miles an hour or so. Um, it liked doing that and, and never had a heating problem. So there's something going on. Thanks for the lies, Richard. I love these talks. Finished and sold the LS and on to a Challenger RT, uh, the 13s VVT. Just curious. I don't. I don't know when they started the VVT stuff. I'm not that familiar with it. And we did run. I did run a cam, uh, a video on a cam that we did on a VVT 5.7, because the guys at Westec had it from the Motor Trend guys, and they let me do a video on it, um, and it, and it worked very well. And it had also the adjustable or the variable and variable cam timing and the variable intake manifold, which is really cool. Uh, what are your favorite sounding Ford and Chevy motors? I don't know. When do I need to change pushrod length is the name of your topic? Yeah, we went we went over when we need to change the pushrod length. We went over all that. When shopping for a turbo, say a 78, 75, not that it matters, you're generally least two hot side AR options, for example, 96 and 1.2 far. What would influence the choice of one versus the other? How, how responsive you want it, and also the turbo sizing and your power needs relative to the displacement of the motor is the way that I look at it. So if I was a 78, 75, let's call that a thousand horsepower turbo. If I was wanting to make a thousand horsepower with a 4.8 or a 5.3, I would pick the tighter AR. If I was wanting to make that same thing with a 6.0 or a, especially a 4.8 or a 4.08, then I would pick the bigger AR. Uh, what would cause an oil ring to break? Normally, that's done during installation. <laughs> I do like the way, uh, I always like the way that um, Terminators sounded. Richard, do you have an estimate on horsepower loss to the drivetrain of manuals and automatics? No, because there, there, there are different manuals and different automatics and, and different, completely different drivetrains. Like the drivetrain on the one, the example I always use is the drivetrain on a Honda, <laughs> whether it's a manual or automatic. That drivetrain is going to be completely different. It's going to lose a different amount, not just a percentage. It's going to lose a different amount than a, you know, Ford 9-inch and a Turbo 400, especially reverse manual valve body, yada, yada, yada. And, and you know, I don't know, 40-inch off-road tires and, and giant 300M axles and, you know, like the, like I said, the nine inch and all that stuff. So the amount that you lose isn't a strict percentage. Uh, Richard, have you ever stood near a top fuel or funny car? I've been down at the, at like winter nationals and stuff. And when they've, 
launched. I never stood next to it when it like like actually on the drag strip, um, only off to the side on the stands. Uh, Brass to and happy help. Uh, Richard, what's the best manual front wheel drive transaction for a front wheel drift? Are you drag racing it or what are you trying to do? Uh, what company or shop do you work for wanting to get an engine built? I don't work for a shop or company. I don't have a shop and I don't work for one. And I, and I don't build engines for people. Oh, Michael, there you go. That was the, and now we're too late, for, but I'll, I'll put that up tomorrow. Twin turbo, six cylinder. <laughs> Gotta love open any questions. Do I want a shop? No, I don't want a shop. I, I love what I do. I love the dyno testing stuff that I do. Is a truck Norris cam the best daily cam for a six liter daily driven truck? I don't know about best. I don't know what your definition of best is. We'd, we'd have to have a lengthy discussion about what, what all the parameters are that go into your definition of best. There's lots and lots of camshafts that you could put in there that you would like and drive around. It would work well. Uh, Richard, would you use a two bolt main big block? We do all the time. Yeah, Dan, that's a, that um, financial advice works with a lot of stuff. What's the normal compression numbers on a stock 5.3? The one I recently purchased is 225 or 230. That seems high for a stock one to me. I'm a big fan of old aircraft piston engine designs. They had developed turbo compounding. Yeah, that's pretty common. A direct exhaust to the turbine connected directly to the crankshaft. Yeah, we don't see that very much on automotive stuff. Uh, Vincent, do you like Steve Morse cams? I've never tried one of his cams. I mean, obviously the guy's, you know, the guy's really sharp and knows how to build power. Uh, yes, Michael, technically there is a best cam, best cam for the LS. Uh, Richard, you're in a new house. Do you miss the tree fort? Yeah, I do miss the tree fort. Um, only because, I mean, I did more videos in it than my kids ever played. In it. <laughs> but it, I, I do miss it. But I have used part of it as uh, I'm going to use it for um, storage for my storage facility down south. Uh, how much power would you go on a two bolt main? We've done lots of big power stuff on two bolts. What's the max bore? We take a 302 to, um, I, I normally go um, 30 or 40 on those. And I don't normally go more than that. You'd probably want a Sonic check it. They want to go to 380 over. I, I would definitely have it sonic check to make sure that that's going to work. Yeah, Dan, it's a small world. Uh, what's up, Rich? I think you missed my question. But would a turbo cam spool a turbo faster than an A cam? 
Well, first of all, there's no universal TurboCam and no universal NA cam. So it, you would have to ask specifically what two cams you're talking about. But the best way to understand that is which one of those cams, when you run the motor NA, makes more low speed power. And we showed this when I did the test of the sloppy stage two versus the truck Norris cam. The truck Norris cam made more low speed power. The cam that makes more low speed power when the motor is NA will almost always, I mean, it has every time I've ever tested it, will offer more low speed turbo response. So it's not an NA cam and a turbo cam. Just think about them as cams. Whichever cam does that will offer more boost response, just like any other application. Just like if we made like a 5.3, because it makes more low speed power, will have more boost response than a 4.8. And the 6.0 will have even more than both of those because it's bigger and it makes more low speed power. That's what you should be thinking about when you're thinking about camshafts. Yeah, the pole was supposed to be a uh, six cylinder twin turbo stuff. So I'll make sure I put that up tomorrow night. Yes, every cam is also a nitrous cam and a blower cam and yada, yada, yada. I remember having that argument with um, uh, Jerry Magnuson, who I respect and <laughs> went a couple of rounds with <laughs> on the, um, him trying to get me fired way back. But uh, I remember talking to him about that and he's like, oh no, when you run these blowers, you got to run the, you know, this kind of camshaft. I'm like, I, I don't, I, in my testing, it hasn't worked out that way. It's worked out that when you make more power NA and you put the blower on there, then it makes more power with the blower. And, but you know, that's sometimes we can't argue with people. Richard, what do you think the performance difference would be between the Chevrolet Performance 227? Is it a 239, 227, 239, a 108? My guess is that the Chevy Performance Cam would probably have maybe more low speed power. But I would, I would think that the that 454 cam probably would make more on the top. I just I don't I ne have never tested the Chevrolet Performance deals. Um, I'm a little concerned with the lower lift. Um, I don't know that I don't know where the crossover would be, but I'm pretty confident that the 454 cam would make more peak power. Every intake manifold is also a turbo manifold. Yeah, I haven't seen one that you couldn't put boost through. What size of turbo would you put on a street driver Ford 400? The turbo that you pick is going to be dictated by the amount of power that you want to make. So if you want to make a thousand, you pick a thousand horsepower turbo. If you want to make, you know, 500, you pick that size turbo. Uh, I don't know that the girdle is going to help you a lot on a two bolt main. I think I'd be more apt to do um, <laughs> a wind tray, but also you could do, um, we just did this on one of the big blocks that I'm uh, having put together. Well, I'm going to put it together, but it, it having the machine work done on it, but we're going from a two bolt to um, four bolt caps on it. Uh, I remember Brian Tilly saying early exhaust valve opening helps spool the turbo. I, I've never seen a camshaft that makes less low speed power in a spool the turbo faster. Uh oh, Google, you had a little fan incident today, huh?
have you ever tested the reversion mufflers that circle truck guys run at the end of their headers? N no, I, I'm not familiar with that. Nitrous does spool the turbo faster, but then nitrous makes more power, right? Anyone know if an LS3 intake needs low profile valley bolts? Not, not from the factory, it doesn't. Would it be smart to put ARP studs and LS9 gaskets with intake spacers and motion race work steam vent kit and bigger radiator in my LS3 G8? Will that help drop temperatures a lot? You, you have some sort of issue with your cooling system, I don't, or or the or the engine itself. But studs and gaskets aren't going to do anything unless you have a bad head gasket. But if you have a bad head gasket, not very often do I see somebody have a bad head gasket and there not be another problem. <laughs> like it, the block needs to be resurfaced or the head needs to be resurfaced or something going on. An MLS gasket doesn't normally blow out and then nothing else is bad. A GT35 off a of Cummings would work for 400. Would it run out of spool range? I I don't know that that's gonna. I don't know how much power you're wanting to make. Is the 400 otherwise stock? Like is it 180 horsepower, 400m or something? A 3A3 my cam is a 112 plus four, 242, 250. Cam. Cam is advanced for drivability, and would I see a power curve change if I ran it straight up? Well, if it's advanced, you already have, um, you've already hurt intake clearance. So if you're gonna, are you gonna retard it then? If you're gonna retard it, then you're, you're gonna improve the clearance. You're gonna have less exhaust clearance, but that's not normally a problem. Having a massive vacuum leak, and the last thing I can think of is the valley bolts not allowing the intake to seat. I haven't seen a factory LS3 intake hit bolts, hit the um, valley bolts. Uh, Tom, I don't, what is a budget HBC headlock? GT40 heads and flat top piston zero deck possible. How much cam lift? Would you need for valve release? The cam lift is not going to be the thing. The duration is the thing that you're concerned with, and you're going to have to measure it. No, the, the dogs are barking at somebody that just came in the house. They're on. They're on. <laughs> they're on perimeter. We just. We did just have a bird fly into our window today. I don't, I don't think he's going to make it. Do you have any idea when Edelbrock will come back on track? I don't know. I have had people complaining about um, customer service for them and for fast. I don't know what's going on. So David's building a thousand horsepower NA small block under 400 inches on pump gas. Seems like a lot. Let's 
So, Richard, you got a 427 now for your CTSV. I really like those cars. Those are cool. 6467s. Where do you want to be with the power on that thing? I mean, you could go nuts and put 278.75s on it. And the LS3 intake shouldn't leak. I've never seen those really seen those split i mean i've seen them blow up when guys nitrous backfire them but uh just yeah make sure the injector o-rings are brand new make sure they're the right size um Uh, Kurt, I don't want anything for, I, I, it's not built. So I don't, I don't have the Cadillac thing done yet. Any issues putting one seven rockers on LQ nine? No, I, but I don't recommend it. I, I would recommend a camshaft over rockers on that because the, um, and, and if you put rockers on it, you're going to have to put springs on it. Cause if you don't have, um, if you got a stock cam and stock springs, one seven rockers, you're going to get into valve float. <laughs> Jason, you didn't miss anything. We've just been waiting for you. Richard, do I see much power gained by machining my GT40 heads? Well, you're going to have to machine them for valve springs. They're going to definitely need valve springs. The milling them will help, but the I wish I had measured the available piston to valve clearance with the GT40 head and then figured out, because what I would want to know on that to answer that question is I'd want to know if we mill the head 10 or 20 or 30, how much piston to valve clearance do we do we get rid of? And now is that limiting the kind of camshaft that I could put in? Would I rather put more camshaft in or get the compression? And maybe that's not even a question. Maybe the amount that we're doing it isn't really going to affect it that much. Uh, Richard, a thousand is good. Those turbos will certainly do that. And I don't know that you're going to have that problem. You're going to have more back pressure on the 427 than you would like on a six liter or a six two. Um, but maybe it's not going to be doing that bad. Seven eighty ones and O forty nines make 550 horsepower in a big block. Yeah. I take a look at the video that I have up on the oval port head test and you can see what what we did on some of the big block stuff i ran some ported 049s and i also ran stock ones and you can kind of see <laughs> Richard, can you afford to run AC? You know what just happened is I think that the AC just went out in my truck. I need to figure out what's going on with that thing. Uh, Jay Moore, I wouldn't put rockers on it. Um, I don't think you need it. Uh, cash, you might, if you, if you retard the camshaft, typically what they do is add more power, but it doesn't always do that. It depends on, um, it depends on the camshaft and, and the combination. And I can't tell you right off the top of my head, what that cam is going to do if you retard it by four degrees or six degrees. That, that's why we test. Gen 5 44 millimeter Turbo Smart wastegates, a Turbo Smart EVOOS controller. I like the Turbo Smart stuff. Those they're good guys over there, and their the products are really good. I don't think uh, grooves. I don't think that this is a problem 
like it didn't run out of coolant. It didn't all leak out or it's not low. I, I, it just, it seems like it stopped working. So something is the, something is turned off. <laughs> something is not operating the way it should. I haven't even looked at it to see what's going on. I haven't made sure that the, the you know, the clutch is working and that it's spinning and Used a fifty thousands exhaust duration issue with GT forty pit. Fifty thousands exhaust duration. Does does duration come in fifty thousands increments? Uh, he was asking about lift, and lift isn't the concern when you're talking about piston to valve clearance. It's it's duration. It's how long you hang the valve open. The the lift will have a little bit of an issue, but n not very much. We can run a stock cam at 600 lift and we won't have piston and valve clearance problems. Uh oh, they're getting tricky. I'm going to clip some wheels now. If the compressor has gone bad, replace the compressor, the expansion valve, and do a thorough flush of everything else. Is proper quench better than the effective compression pressure? I don't know that you're juggling it that much. The, the, when we when people want to talk about quench, the, and I've got to get going, but the, when they talk about quench, what I really envision is is piston to head clearance, and I'm more concerned about that. I don't want the head to hit the piston and the or the piston to hit the head, um, and so that's going to give us, you know, somewhere in the thirty to forty thousands quench normally is. Is kind of where it is, unless like what we we're talking about, like with a Dodge, where it's 200 down the hole, then you can run whatever camshaft you want, and you don't ever have to worry about piston to head interference or piston to valve interference. Um, but the quench kind of works itself out when you do that, and then so does the compression. Um, I normally don't try to juggle the compression based on those things. The compression, if I'm deciding on compression on a build, I don't do that based on those two things. I base that on the the where the piston is in the hole. And then obviously, like I said, I want that safety margin of where the piston and the head are that I need that distance. Um, I care less about the quench than I do about however I'm shaping the piston and the combustion chamber so that I get the compression that I want. Could be the blender door actuator. Mine went out and thought it was an AC system. Okay, one more question. It'll be important because it's, you know, it's 95 or 100 and, and driving down to West Tech all the way with no AC, that's, that's not going to be fun. I think when the AC goes out in the truck, it's just time to buy a new truck, right? So that... So that's your formula racer D is four thousandths piston to head clearance for every one thousandths piston to wall clearance. The volumetric efficiency doesn't affect the engine. Your engine combination is going to dictate the volumetric efficiency. <laughs> Did you see if the AC belt is there? I I think all those are run on one belt, right? Maybe maybe it's not. I don't I don't ever run those on the dyno. You 
to service your truck AC with propane. <laughs> just roll the windows down. Then I just have hot air. I was, um, I went somewhere with my wife today and we got in the car and it was hot and, and she turned on the AC and it was just blowing hot air because it, you know, when it first starts, it's blowing hot air. And I said, so I just want to let you know that remember when I was driving the Chevy Sprint Turbo from Vegas out to West Tech, I said, and I had the fan on because it didn't have AC. It just had a fan. I said, this is what it was like. This is what it was like me driving in that car from West Tech to Vegas or from Vegas to West Tech. Um, it was miserable. <laughs> it, I, I used to tell people it felt like I was driving. Um, it was obviously very hot. And, but it felt like I was driving with somebody aiming a blow dryer at me. But I had to have some sort of like, you know, ventilation going because it was just miserable. Uh, would you give up your AC for more power? I wouldn't in my truck because I don't really don't care how much power it makes. I don't ever race anybody in it. But I did give up my AC on my Camaro and on my 240Z and on the Sprint. Uh, Aaron, the piston to wall is an interesting question, but it's mostly going to be dictated by what piston you have and what the growth rate of the piston is, because the growth rates of the pistons are different. So you have to have more or less piston to wall, or piston to wall clearance um, for the piston, depending on how much heat you're putting into it and what the growth rate is of the piston. Uh, Richard, what was the top speed of your five liter before you hopped up? When it was when it was all stock, it went 140. I want, I need to go back and look and see. It was either 143 or 147. And then we eventually got it up to 193, I think. Okay, guys, I got to get going. <laughs> Thank you all for showing up. I promise we'll have the we'll have our poll for tomorrow night. Uh, twin turbo six cylinder stuff. I don't. I don't. That's what happens. I have my stuff in front of me, and then I take it because I use it. And I was going over more information, and you know that, that happens. Thank you guys all for showing up. I will see you all tomorrow. Bang, bang, zoom to the moon, Alice.